thank you for making the time to join us. Um, so yeah, uh, for those who are not familiar, um, this is part of a project from the Global Data Barometer. So um, for the so the Global Data Barometer um, basically came about um, as a result of uh, you know a, a lack of a global indicator or comparable uh, a global indicator for comparison around uh, data. Uh, so the last time it uh, there was one, if I'm not mistaken, was around 2018 for the open data parameter, and that was only for a limited set of countries. So in 2019, um, uh, at the Open Government Partnership Summit in Canada, there were calls by countries that says we need a new uh, we need a new data parameter or open data parameter for for the world, um, and we need to have it comprehensive as well to cover as many countries as possible. Um, and as part of that new consultative process, um, you know, it was decided to not call it just open data and not to limit um, uh, the, um, the indicator to just simply um, open data, but to also include um, just data for development in general. Um, so as a result, um, this, is, uh, this is how it was designed uh, for, this, for this year's or 2022 um, Global Data Barometer, where you know, the key pillars are governance, capability, availability, use, and impact. Um, and our amazing researchers who are here um, you know, put way more than they were supposed to <laughs> in the two week period to gather as much information as possible. Um, so the reason that we did these country profiles um, was basically that uh, while the indicators are extremely useful um, uh, at a glance, you know, to, to see the state of where a country is um, um, individually or comparatively with other countries, um, it kind of hides the amount of research done behind it into just numbers and graphs. Um, so what we wanted to do with the country profiles was, um, you know, to give a little bit more context, to extract um, the research, the background research done by researchers, to understand more about the countries um, and what the indicators mean um, in terms of, you know, the context of that country um, as a kind of brief snapshot. Um, that's understandable for everyone, um, not just whether it has capacity or not, but you know how's the ecosystem of the uh, open data in that country, uh, how is it governed, and so on. Uh, where is it? Uh, what's the context in terms of you know in the um, development status of the country, and so on. Uh, so, city here has been going through the data, <laughs> working on the couple, and coming up with these snapshots and getting feedback from the country researchers. Um, you know, on whether this provides a context. Um, so she'll share um, uh, a bit of her findings from doing the country profiles. Um, and then as she mentioned earlier, we also have some of our researchers to also share some of their insights into, you know, the research that they've, uh, extensive research that they've done, uh, and also help answer any questions that you might, might have about the findings that we got from the Global Data Barometer um, for the nine con um, 11 countries in, uh, in Asia and Southeast Asia. So yeah, City, over to you. Okay, thank you, Kaido. Um, so let's begin the presentation. Um, okay, so my, uh, are you able to help here? Okay, okay. Um, so the I'll first tell a bit a bit more about the GDB, um, which Kaido already explained a bit, and then I'll go a bit on the global findings first before going to Asia. Um, and then I'll go into Asia um, and we'll focus on 11 countries um, that were uh, that was under this project. And then uh, we'll look a bit at the country profiles that I've prepared uh, and uh, uploaded onto the D4D website. And then we'll look at uh, latest developments after the project, uh, after the survey has completed. So as mentioned by Kyril, the Global Data Barometer was published this year. Um, it covers uh, four uh, pillars. Governance, uh, so governance looks at um, data protection, data management, and uh, data sharing uh, in the public sector. What has the government done in, 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 um, in, in making sure that there is governance over this, uh, these areas. Capabilities is whether there is um, capabilities, training uh, in the government, uh, 
for in particular on data uh, skills. Use and impact is um, when the data is available, uh, has been used to uh, for impact. For example, whether the, whether the procurement data that is available has been used to identify uh, areas of uh, improvement of in procurement and availability is uh, basically what data sets are available whether by the government or by other organizations in the country and all of this will summarize to what extent the countries are managing data for public good. Um, there were 109 countries covered um, the country um, the average uh, score globally is just is 34. Um, no other, no country has scored uh, over 70. I think the maximum was um, United States with a score of 68. Um, of the as you can see in the in this map, um, the highest, the darkest uh, regions are the highest scores, which is in the North American region and in the Europe as well. So next we'll see um, the global by the global scores. Um, so globally we average around um, 34 overall, and by availability we have 30. Uh, 30 uh, capabilities 42, which is quite high. Uh, use and impact 22, and governance 36. Uh, there is also a scoring by module. Um, so in the GDB there is scoring by pillar. Uh, and then some indicators are by module. So it, they are quite overlapping, so you need to uh, look at it separately. Uh, and then like, some of the indicators under uh, use and impact and availability are under uh, company information or public procurement, for example. So that's how you see uh, the, the analyze the scores. Uh, now we look at Asia. So in the GDP report, they actually cover 15 countries, um, but I will only, uh, uh, my country profiles only cover 11. So the ones that are not covered is uh, South Korea, China, Hong Kong, and uh, I can't remember that one. Yeah, so um, these are the scores uh, achieved by this region. So South Korea actually achieved higher score than Taiwan. I um, think it was about 64, if I'm not mistaken. But in the 11 countries, uh, Taiwan scored the highest and um, Nepal scored the lowest, yeah. Uh, 13. Um, and then, so we can see that Taiwan exceeds um, uh, the global average in all in all of the uh, pillars. Um, and uh, in the region, we uh, we seem to have high higher use and impact uh, higher use and impact than the global average, whereas uh, Nepal has achieved lower scores than the average in global. Okay, uh, some of the findings uh, in this region is that uh, if you compare income to the scores, it does not seem to correlate directly. As you can see that Malaysia and Taiwan, um, we have, they have uh, really high uh, income uh, GNI per capita but it uh, and it, uh, they are all, they have comparably the same scores as India and Indonesia which has much lower GNI per capita um, so uh, I guess this is where the diversity in Asia comes in where we need to look at the data issues keep, um, really at this country level and um, the solution does not seem to be just um, economic reasons yeah um, but in terms of classifications the higher income countries so the upper middle income is Malaysia Taiwan and uh, Thailand uh, which uh, that on, there's only three countries among these 11 uh, which achieve higher scores in general and which have higher capabilities overall so um, I think it uh, it reflects the global uh, average as well, uh, where good capability scores is always the highest. Um, but it does not seem to translate directly to the availability and impact score, which as shown in the next slide, uh, this slide, where um, higher capabilities uh, has higher uh, availability of data. Uh, except for Malaysia, for some reason, um, Taiwan 
uh, has the highest score in capabilities and high, uh, has high availability of data, um, and then followed by the rest. Yeah. Only Malaysia has the has high capability but low availability of data. Um, and next we have uh, capabilities versus impact, as mentioned. Um, so uh, high capabilities high availability but it does not seem to translate to high impact um, for some reason i mean the the countries are since uh, they don't go up they just uh, start to uh, scatter down um, so uh, they they are not as high as we uh, expect them according to their capability but to be fair, the um, the impact measured was only for across four use cases. So perhaps um, they may need, need to be analyzed further of what impact do they mean? Like, if there, is there any other impact that we are not or can we not see in the GDP measurements? Um, in the country profile, so I have looked. Uh, I have analyzed a few. Uh, underneath the capabilities, governance, uh, availability, and use and impact. Um, so I've looked at how how many countries have achieved this and how many uh, which countries have achieved that. So uh, thankfully for the capabilities uh, in the four types of indicators, um, a, a majority has uh, open data initiative and widespread uh, regular civil servants, more than half of uh, countries. Although uh, less than half has um, subnational institutional capabilities, and um, also less than half have uh, support for data reuse, which is where um, the data reuse is where the initiatives on how the data is used in uh, events like hackathons for the public. Yeah. Um, and then for governance. Um, uh, it's quite interesting that a lot of countries in Asia have data protection laws, um, and which have force of law. Uh, and but sadly, only one country, uh, India, has a framework that with a force of law. Um, no country in the eleven country has any frameworks with a force of law. Only seven has, but they don't have the force of law. So yeah, this is quite interesting. Uh, and for availability, um, a lot of it varies from country to country, and I guess um, it depends on the focus of the government at that time. So, for example, Malaysia has uh, data on public procurement, public finance, um, uh, um, and but yet does not have sufficient data on health and COVID uh, land as well as climate action. So uh, different countries has different availability. Um, it's not, uh, it's very different across the, every, for every country. So um, I guess uh, that is where the priorities of each country is different. Um, the next is the use and impact. So there were four use cases um, that were analyzed uh, in the report. Uh, in the survey, um, most um, very little countries actually showed uh, use that is widespread, regular, and embedded. Um, uh, and most, and for example, for corporate due diligence, uh, some may have company information, but they were not used for uh, widely or regularly by any countries. Uh, same goes for the second one, which is for land data, uh, whether the, the land data has been used for inclusion, uh, equitable land uses. Um, no country has showed such evidence uh, in a regular manner, mostly just used on an ad hoc basis. Uh, and some actually even the data is available, but it's not even open. So that is the, the um, analysis that I found. So the country profiles that I uh, we have prepared uh, is on the website, so od 4 asiahuborg um, So in this country profiles, there are some scores, uh, the 
whether it's green, red, red, red or yellow. So green means um, it has widespread evidence or um, for the government's governance means that uh, it's got uh, force of law, whereas yellow is uh, no, there's a, there exists a framework, but no, no force of law. Um, so it's basically to summarize uh, the findings in each country. Uh, and then there is also a socioeconomic background and also a data ecosystem on how the data flows, for example, from the government to the international organization and from private sector to government. Uh, and some other indicators like internet users um, and how many um, uh, the R&D contribution to the GDP is. Yeah. And um, I've received uh, feedback from the uh, from all of you, uh, from uh, all of you based on the country profiles. So in 2022, um, uh, the Taiwan government uh, in the report Taiwan climate uh, climate data sets were uh, not available. So they have prepared. They have now a climate action plan uh, released uh, in March 2022. Uh, and the nation parliament just passed a data protection bill uh, in September. And in Malaysia, this was not covered in the survey. There was a data sharing policy um, that was circulated. And the data sharing policy was um, included also a, a policy on data management. And uh, Bangladesh was also drafted a data protection bill in April. Um, that's all from me. Um, so now we'll, uh, if you have, does anyone have any questions? If there is no, then we'll uh, start with um, Lynn, who will provide feedback on the um the the uh, country report for vietnam um lin would you like to start first uh hi, good afternoon everyone uh thank you very much for your presentation city it was a uh, very insightful um, uh so can uh sorry can you hear me uh yeah okay now so thank you very much again, once again, for your presentation and thank you for inviting me to share the new updates of um, data related policies in Vietnam. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to join this section and I learn from you and I learn from everybody. So following up on your questions, um, then I would like to say that um, the uh, GDP country report on Vietnam um, was very useful and uh, informative. Um, the conclusion that uh, Vietnam showed some strength in terms of governance, actually in terms of regulations and uh, capabilities were um, were correct. And uh, the what what we are missing is mostly about uh, data availability and um, use and impact. That is what we are missing. Um, back at the time uh, when we did um, conducted the research for the GDP team, then Vietnam still uh, didn't have um, a general law for personal data protection yet. Um, and even now, we still don't have. Um, but the Ministry of Public Security is in charge of drafting the personal data protection degree. And, and there is already a uh, published an announcement that Vietnam is going to have uh, the law on personal data protection following up on the draft degree on personal data protection. Um, the expected time um, for that to be launched is uh, I guess going to be by the end of this year for the draft degree to uh, be finalized and published by the Ministry of Public Security. And uh, for the law de development, I think it will be within the next, on the next year, like 2023 or 2024. Meanwhile, <clears throat> so um, I would like also to comment um, a little bit on the data infrastructure in Vietnam. So um, uh, I ha may have mentioned at the, 
at our research report submitted to GDP team, but we also want to summarize again that we have uh, tried to, Vietnam has tried to develop six national databases, a national population database, national land database, national business registration database, national financial database, and national insurance database. Amongst all of these six and national databases, um, the key priority is on the national population database, which uh, takes charge of the digital identity, which is like the core of the data ecosystem in the, especially in the public sector as well as in the whole um, data ecosystem. And the um, national population database uh, is taken care by the Ministry of Public Security. Um, and meanwhile, um, what right now, um, the data, the basic data infrastructure is there. And now the government is uh, moving forward with the next stage of, um, how to say, increase the quality of data. So first they complete the uh, core infrastructure of the data, like creating the key national databases, and now is the next stage of fine-tuning the quality of the data and enhance, um, um, how to say, enhance um, the values generated from the data. So the Ministry of Information and Communications um, has built uh, successfully launched the national data exchange platform, which connects more than 90 ministries, sectors, localities, and enterprises with 10 databases and eight information systems. And this uh, platform in 2021 has facilitated uh, almost one uh, eight, 81 million data transactions. Um, so, um, and also like <clears throat> uh, in terms of, um, but at the same time, at the same time, at each um, local government, they are still at, at that stage of uh, fine tuning their own um, data infrastructure. So it's still an ongoing process, but the basic uh, have been completed. Now they are moving to the next stage. In terms of, um, Mm -hmm. open data, there's one update, uh, that is the uh, Vietnamese government has made uh, another step forward to advance open government data by passing uh, a decision about um, the list of open data that state uh, agency should prioritize. And um, but uh, from our observation, and we also provide our recommendations for this uh, list uh, that is issued by the Ministry of Information and Communication, um, is because uh, the list of open data here are very at the basic level. For example, in education, like how many high schools are there, or how many kindergartens, or how many uh, employment centers. So they are very basic um, <laughs> data sets. And also in, uh, in addition to the fact that the data sets are still at a very basic level and do not yet have that much, much like value, then also like um, the quality of the standards for the data are also not that high level. They just still focus on making it there. Um, they do not uh, concentrate on um, makes like Word document, if it's PDF documents, and it's okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so open data in Vietnam is still, I think, like quite, even takes still quite some more time for it to, to develop. So that is some, um, oh, ah, and Recently, uh, the Vietnam National Assembly passed um, the law on the grassroots uh, democracy at the local level. And that law once again enhanced the 
um, people's right of access to information and to request information. So um, that can also be an important factor to promote more the openness and transparency and uh, create a better background for open data. Yeah. So if you have any question, um, then please let me know. That is uh, some brief uh, updates from Vietnam. Thank you, Lin. Um, that is very uh, interesting to see the developments in Vietnam. I think we all in Asia has the same issues of granularity, um, all data is in PDFs and not in machine readable format. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, thank you, Lin. Um, I'll pass it on to Moon Moon um, from India, who has achieved quite a high score. So, maybe then she can share how things can be better for the Lord. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you, Siti. I'm just going to share a quick presentation that I made. Give me a second. Is my screen visible? Sorry for the background noise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you everybody for joining the webinar. I am the country researcher for India for GDP 2022. I thought that for this presentation, what might be useful is to highlight Sorry. Is, is my screen visible? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. So, okay. So I thought what would be useful for this presentation is to highlight some of the key takeaways that we can take from the GDP country report for India. I would also like to highlight some recent developments because in the past year, there are quite a lot of updates that have um, that have happened in this open data space in India. And I would welcome your feedback. Um, comments are always appreciated. Okay, so to start off, I think Carol mentioned about the four pillars that, um, that the GDP report has. So I'm going to go pillar by pillar. In the first one that we have governance, India had the highest score, India has the highest scores in governance amongst these South Asian countries. And that's largely because of um, a couple of reasons, right? So first, India has well-defined data protection laws. We have the Information Technology Act 2000, or what is colloquially known as the IT Act. The IT Act gives a legal framework to electronic governance and digital records in India. Uh, Siti also mentioned in the presentation that we are the only country with data management frameworks in the region. And that is because of uh, the National Data Sharing and Accessibility Policy 2012, or what is called as NDSAP. So the NDSAP mandates the, uh, it mandates the facilitation of data, which is generated because of public funds. So any of the government policies which have been funded by the public money, the data sets which are generated, they have to be shared with the citizens with the larger aim of public good so that people are able to engage and participate in the discussion. The only, uh, the only area in which India has, no, uh, has not made a headway is the data sharing framework. So that is to say that while India has ND SAP to, um, to sort of uh, facilitate the sharing between governments and uh, citizens, 
India does not have a framework for sharing of non-personal data between businesses, entities, communities, and governments. Um, in, in terms of re recent developments, so the government has acknowledged that we lack a data sharing framework. So the PDP bill or the personal data protection bill was tabled in the parliament, but it has been withdrawn. Um, I think it was withdrawn just a couple of months past. And uh, the reason, the, uh, I, the, it's it's interesting why the, why the bill has been withdrawn. So the jury is still out that why the bill was withdrawn. Uh, one one um, one group claims that it is because if this bill uh, would have passed, then it would have led to this formation of Orwellian state in India. Or while the other group claims um, that this bill was not comprehensive and we need a more comprehensive bill. So not sure what the reason is, but as, as of August, I think August 2022, the, the bill has been withdrawn. So I'll move on to the next pillar, which is capabilities. India also scored the highest score, uh, got the highest score in capabilities amongst the South Asian um, countries. So there are a couple of reasons for it. First, India has historically a very like a rigorous training plan for civil servant recruits, and there has been a renewed focus of the current government to make this training grounded in reality and make it very um, um, like make it in tune with the times. So the modules of civil service training has been updated to include data analysis, data visualization. How do we the, the how do we get the data from the people given the informal society that India generally has? And how can we use such data sets for public good? Uh, this is under the uh, very famous Mission Karmiyogi um, project in India. Now, I mentioned the NDSAP policy, uh, National Data Sharing and Accessibility Policy in the previous slide. So while the NDSAP mandates the launching of open data portal, uh, so it was done way back in India um, in 2012. So we have opendata.gov dot in ogd.gov.in and I'll encourage you all to go and see what all data sets this has. But this open data portal is not without its gaps, right? So this open data gov portal, while it has made uh, data sets available to people at large, these data sets, as is the case with Vietnam, they are not machine readable. So they are in PDF format, some of them. They are unsynchronous data. The metadata is not shared. So long story short, while data is there, it does not really benefit the people without, without a lot of working with the data which is there to, to make it understandable to people at large. The government of India has taken note of this and uh, has taken st some steps to fix this issue. And that brings me to the third point, which is that the Niti Aayog, which is the think tank of economic development in India, to put it very simplistically, has, has launched the National Data and Analytics Platform, which is a step above um, of the open data portal. So in the NDAP, the data sets, it was launched in, I think, June 2022, uh, so the claim is that in NDAP, the uh, sets are organized, the sets are the data sets are standardized, and the data sets are somewhat easier for people to use. Uh, one area that we lack, even though we have received the highest scoring capabilities, one area that we lack is the subnational capabilities to manage data. So we have the we have certain states which have done very well. So Tamil Nadu, Kerala, they top charts, Telangana. Uh, they have done very well in um, formulating and launching these open data policies and open data uh, portals at the provincial level, at the state level. But of course, um, more states, more, more majority of the states are still lagging. I'm going to move to the third pillar now, which is the availability of data. So um, carrying forward the point from my previous slide where there is there are gaps between data availability and data usability. 
The takeaway is that data is available across modules. So we have data available, whether it's in PDF, whether it's in JPG images, but data is available. There is a larger question about data accessibility. So the data is not machine readable. The data is not translated into different languages, which hinders the public participation. In a nutshell, data is available, but it is not beneficial. Um, it has to go through various levels of data accessibility, data, um, just opening up the data for the larger public, so for, for the people to engage with the data, for, for, for the engagement to feed into the social good. Um, that takes me to the fourth pillar, which is use and impact. So I thought what would be um, useful in use and impact, because I think the, the use cases have already been mentioned by Siti in her slide. I thought what would be useful is to see a couple of organizations who have taken the, um, the sort of closed data sets of Indian government and have been able to achieve remarkable results. Um, I'm, I have highlighted two um, two organizations here. The first is Civic Data Lab. Okay. So I'll just quickly show. So we also have Data Meet. We, there are a couple of other organizations, but I really like the work of Civic Data Lab. So I'm going to quickly take you there. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is Civic Data Lab. What they have been able to do is say in public finance, so say one of the problems in public finance is that the, uh, the Indian government, it mandates the publishing of expenditures and receipts, et cetera, budget documents, because it's in the law, they have to do it. But they do it in PDF, which is not really amenable to any sort of tweaking around or analyzing the data. So what this group has been able to do is like say something like this, Open Budgets India, with working with Open Budgets India, where they make visualizations and they explore the data and make makes it very easy, right? So one of one of the things that I like is see this. Yeah. So this makes it very easy and understandable to um, to to somebody who's not very well versed with data. Uh, and this is just one of the examples what they have done. They also sort of show the flow, how it works. So this is one of the ways which a couple of organizations in India have, um, have, have used the data sets of the government. I'll encourage you to check out Data Meet. Uh, from my knowledge, this organization is not really operative, but some of the work that they have done is pretty cool and, and good to see. That's it from my side, everybody. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Moonil. Um, um, so I've shared the links that Moonil um, shared if you hope a bit with us before. Uh, we'll, say, we'll also share her slides uh, later for all the participants here. Yeah. Um, so I'll open the floor for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I've I've seen this as a trend uh, from Open Data Barometer as well. Um, is the difficulty in impact um, in in countries have actually showing you know that. We're pushing for open data or advocating for it, um, but quite often there's little to show for it. Uh, I think um, um, I think moment you've shared a few examples. You know how you know when there's a lack of granularity and so on, where it doesn't um, um, how to say it, it just doesn't work because it's not useful or it's the 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 data that you need to do something of impactful is not there. Uh, where, but if you look at it an overall score, there's a lot of data available. Um, so I, I just like to um, kind of op uh, ask um, both uh, of you, but also to anybody else, in the, uh, other researchers here in the room, um, what what are some of the ideas that you think uh, could be done? You know, if you were going to suggest to government, it's like, look, uh, 
this is I think this is the areas that you should prioritize um, in terms of you know making sure that uh, these specific sets of data or initiatives will allow uh, you know uh, the data that's being made available to be um, more impactful. Because the common question I, I get from government is that we're releasing so much, <laughs> how come nobody's using it, right? Um, so yeah, so as a perspective, as a researcher and from your findings, like, um, you know, what, what if you were in a position to advise government, like what would you think to tell them? It's like, okay, these are the things that you should prioritize and work on so that we can see more impact. So yeah, um, your opinions. Uh, Um, anyone of you? Lynn, would you like to? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Caroline. Uh, and thank you, Siti. And thank you, Umut, for your great presentation. So, from our perspective uh, about Vietnam, and I believe that it, it should always, uh, to do a good work, to do a good strategy or good planning, it should always start with evidence, right? So. We would strongly encourage um, the government to do a very um, serious uh, research. Uh, first of all, like on the um, a systematic um, research gathering uh, evidence to understand the maturity of the data infrastructure of the public sector in Vietnam and also the private sector. Um, like uh, the in terms of data availability and data maturity, that is that should be ready to be shared, like from public and private sector. That is like on the uh, supply side. At the same time, they should do also like research to understand on the demand side what the people will look for uh, when they look to data. Because the key question is not that data is available, but how the available data can be used to generate the value. So, um, yeah, they, they need to um, conduct research and um, um, to understand both the supply and the demand side uh, of open data. Um, otherwise, I also uh, think that um, there is some uh, kind of challenge um, for the uh, for the government, at least in Vietnam, to dig deeper into open data. First of all, is that they really want to focus on um, extracting um, values from the data that they have. So they have invested in building this public sector data infrastructure and they want to you know charge people also for having access to the data so when that incentive is stronger um you know because they have this digital identity so now um on the national population database so that is a core of the digital identity so on the banking system right like everything on the business sector has to ask for um, their access to this uh, database. So if they charge even a little amount of money, then in accumulation, it would be a lot of revenue for them. So uh, yeah, it will be like, um, for now, what I'm observing for now is that, yeah, they really are prioritizing the, um, the, the um, creating the value for uh, like, um, charging the money for assessing the data and why open data is still there on the agenda but it's not the priority but rather um, a commitment to international organizations or to international you know presentations so um yeah when it's lacking the the incentive but if they really um start to to see like a more um, benefits of having open data and especially when um, the government pay more attention to transparency and accountability of government agency then uh, by that time but I think it will take some more years 
uh, then um, there will be more, much more attention to the open data. Uh, would you like to say something? Yeah, so uh, great question, Carol, and something which um, a question I think would require a lot of thought and I think deserves a seminar in its own right. But off the top of my head, I want to say that I think people would be most interested in talking about data and i think most amount of public good would come from opening data sets which matter to people and i can currently think of three perhaps three four areas where data or availability of public data is important so firstly i think public finance right budget matters it affects yours and my bottom line and the data in that sector though a lot has been done with the open budgets but still we have a lot of data which is in pdf which is not machine readable or they are like like images right and i think that is one data set if it's open to people if it's it's launched with easy to make visualization so that normal people can understand if it's if it's available in many languages then i think there'll be more a public participation and and an incentive, people already have an incentive to see to those data, but I think a lot of interesting insights would come when people engage from say budgets data. Another area is the tax data. I'm not aware of what, what sort of tax data is released by the government of India, but that is one thing I can think of. Um, one another area is in when it comes to uh, climate disasters, right? So ISRO, um, which is the national agency, space resource agency, which also gets data, um, uh, collects data on uh, so cli um, on floods, droughts, in case there is like a heavy rainfall. Uh, those data, the spatial data of that is not yet open. Um, it is if i remember correctly it's paid for and so that also hinders many people from using those data to generate their own insights um one another region or one another area could be uh, the assets and declarations of elected public officials so in india um, it is mandated that all the assets will um, within a particular time period they have to be submitted to the electoral um the electoral body but all of them almost all of them are done in pdf and i had a chance i had a brief conversation of talking to the organizer uh, organization which sort of converts from pdf to to like you know to inputs and i like how do you do and do you have a system and they're like no we take the pdf and we do have like manually one data by one data and given the um given how many elected officials we have that is a lot of overhead and uh, people are curious to know what their elected officials are up to what they own how they own is it even you know some it, it helps in forming a public opinion of the official of your elected officials so i think people will also be interested in those um to summarize i would say that uh, public finance data tax data disaster related data um assets and declarations of elected officials any any such data sets which hit average people like you and me i think that that would be a good place to start thank you yeah thank you very much for sharing that um there is a comment by isat um lynn would you like to highlight some brief findings on the pdp assessment Um, uh, thank you for raising this. If you are interested in seeing this um, PDP review, then I can share like some slides to, um, because it's just easier to show through the slides. Do you mind that or you prefer me to just? Uh, whichever you prefer. Um, 
so um, November 2021 until June 2022, we have conducted a comprehensive review of personal data protection practices of local government uh, in Vietnam across uh, 63 provinces and cities. And um, our um, sample size are the, uh, the uh, we conducted the review on the 63 e-government portals. So these e-government portals are the places that provide uh, information uh, about the government program, government decisions, and everything. Basically, um, access to information um, provided by the government. Um, and uh, we also assessed uh, PDP practices on 63 e public service portals and 50 government citizen interaction apps um, that are available. And uh, in, in our review, we focus on two dimensions. Uh, first is uh, privacy policy and second is um, expression or the implementation of privacy policies. Mm, so, because uh, we talk a lot also about uh, regulations, but um, uh, regulation is one thing. Like uh, when we review, conducted these reviews, and we realized that uh, actually there are already like some uh, very quite detailed uh, regulations uh, about the personal data protection uh, online um, that the government agencies should do. Uh, in Vietnam. However, uh, with this uh, review, we realized that um, it's quite a challenge or it's still missing in implementation. Um, so with the review, we um, conducted the 14 uh, criteria for the privacy policy. Um, that is like about whether there is such a privacy policy and whether it's accessible in uh, Vietnamese language and in English or both, because uh, according to our reviews, most of these priv privacy policy are implemented because they um, mostly on, on the apps and the apps they have this privacy policy because it's a requirement of the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. Um, so it's just um, a mandatory requirement and most of them are in English, which means that they are not available uh, to normal Vietnamese citizens who cannot speak English. And we also assess whether this privacy policy uh, cite the legal basis for processing personal data because um, according to the existing regulation, Vietnam do, do not yet have the that law on personal data protection or even that draft degree is not yet published. But even the existing regulations already say that um, uh, local government or government agencies should uh, provide a basis, legal basis for to um, prove that they have legitimate purposes for processing personal data. And we also uh, try to review to see if um, um, there's a ident correct ident identification of the responsibility of government agency towards data subjects' rights and whether the data subjects are clearly identified and, and uh, with other um, criteria like who, with whom the data will be shared with, children's privacy, what type of information is collected, what's the purpose, whether there's a notification, if there is case of data breach, whether there's a notification of um, a privacy risk and would they inform the citizens of what measures are there to be in place to protect this data and whether they show commitment to um, inform the data subjects when there are updates of data privacy, privacy policy. And of course, like one important mechanism is whether there's that contact point um, uh, to serve as a point for um, citizens to approach if they have any complaints or concerns about the processing of their personal data. Um, and in terms of implementation, uh, we assess like three criteria uh, about the, the right to inform consent, and the right to restrict scope and use of personal data, and the right to question or request access to uh, and submit complaint. 
And uh, the review shows that um, there is still a huge missing uh, uh, privacy policy. And in our uh, recommendations, we highlight that uh, key recommendations that uh, government agents government agencies should um, really consider the privacy policy as an e-contract between a government agency and citizen, uh, which um, show the um, responsibilities of the uh, government agency towards the personal data of citizens and also demonstrate to citizens what rights do they have towards their personal data and what mechanism do they have to exercise those rights towards their personal data. Because with digital transformation, then a lot of personal data are increasingly uh, collected. And as you can see from here, um, the first column means that only three out of uh, 63 e-public service uh, portal is about the e-government um, electronic public service that are provided online. Then only three uh, of these portals have uh, privacy policy. Meanwhile, these e-government public service portals are the ones that collect um, the majority of personal data here. Then the second column is about um, um, four, only four out of the 63 e-government portals, which is responsible for providing information to citizens that have privacy policy. And only in terms of the apps that I mentioned before, because it's the mandatory requirements on the international platforms like um, Google Play or Apple Store. So that's why we can see the higher um, ratio of the um, identified privacy policy. So from this brief observation, we can see that that means that uh, with the officials actually in Vietnam, it's mandatory for the local governments to have to each province to have um, one e-public service portal and one uh, e-government uh, portal. But for these two official mandatory um, platforms to interact uh, with citizens, then the government do not yet have that enforcement and in, um, institutionalized rules to make um, on the, this platform to have the privacy policies. Meanwhile, the apps, which are more or less like uh, based on uh, voluntary needs of the um, province. Basically, if the province feels like it's better to have apps to interact with citizens and they can have it, it's not mandatory. So that's why we can only identify 50 out of 63 a province that have apps and out of these 53 apps, only uh, 32 have uh, the privacy policy. So basically we- oh, Sorry, um, so oh, yes. we're ending the, I mean, close to the end of the schedule, because okay. we were supposed to end it for. So okay. um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, is sure. it okay if I share the slides with the participants later? Because right. some of the participants- Sure. Wanted, yeah, okay. So yeah, um, thank you everyone. I think one one also left already. So thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you, Cairo, for um, asking questions. I hope um, uh, every, I'll, I will share the presentation slides later of Moon and Lynn and mine later. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you for. Yeah. If there's any questions, then just um, yes. Thank you. I don't know. I'm, I was just saying bye bye. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thanks bye. for joining. Okay. Yeah. Bye.